welcome to the Law School Toolbox Podcast. Today we are talking about something every law student will spend a lot of time on, reading cases and preparing for class. Your Law School Toolbox hosts are Allison Monahan and Lee Burgess, that's me. We're here to demystify the law school and early legal career experience so you'll be the best law student and lawyer you can be. We're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, Bar Exam Toolbox, and the Catapult Conference. Allison also runs the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review on iTunes. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can reach us via our contact form on lawschooltoolbox.com, and we'd love to hear from you. And with that, let's get started. Welcome back. Today, we're going to dive into one of those law school day-to-day realities, reading cases and preparing for class, because ultimately... You're going to end up spending most of your days reading and, well, preparing for class. And believe it or not, there is kind of a right way and a wrong way to prepare, although there are options. So this podcast is going to give you some valuable tips to make sure you are getting the most out of your study time. First, let's start by talking about why reading cases and preparing for class can seem so daunting and difficult. Lee, why do you think this is? Well, I think the main reason is just the volume of work. I think oftentimes law students are surprised at how many hours they end up prepping for class. I think a common assumption that most law students should make is that they need about an hour to an hour and a half of class prep time um, for each hour of class. So if it's a four unit class and you meet four hours a week, you're probably going to have at least eight or more hours I'm sorry, that was bad math. Let me try that again. If you have a four unit class that meets for four hours a week, you could have, you know, four to eight hours of reading assignments just for that one class. And it's typical that most uh, law students are going to take like 13 to 15 units a semester and the hours really start to add up. So I think the volume of work is probably the first reason that preparing for class feels like such a grind. Right. I mean, I think if anyone can get away with reading four hours a week for their law school class, I'd like to meet that person because because that does not sound realistic to me. I think your upper range of eight hours a week per class is probably going to end up being more accurate for a lot of people. At least in that first year, first semester. I mean, you know, sometimes we say an average reading speed, once you're kind of up to speed, you're not having to look up every other word in Black's Law Dictionary, would be 10 hours, or sorry, 10 one hour per 10 pages. Right. So, you know, if you have oftentimes 20 to 30 pages assigned per class, that means you're going to do two or three hours of reading for that class alone. Yeah. One, like just that one class that yeah. day, not even the whole week that day. Right. It's really, it's really challenging. And I think the other thing that's challenging or the other thing that um, makes the beginning of the first semester kind of unique is a lot of these 1L classes start with these archaic old English cases that are even more difficult to get through. So any, you know, case law can be kind of challenging, but, you know, they start with something from the 1800s and they're using, you know, older English phrasing that's not even current legal terminology. They're using weird names. They're using um, like kind of, I guess, slang or common terminology for things we don't even reference anymore. I mean, when contracts, you'll read all these crazy cases about ships and different kinds of chicken or yeah, <laughs> like replevin. Yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> you're just like, what in the world are these people talking about? I know. Or in property, but, you're going to read some bizarre cases about foxes and um, like all the, the stuff that, you know, we don't really worry about, you know, who was chasing the fox anymore necessarily, but in property law, that's a really big deal. Right, exactly. And just, you know, I think a lot of the concepts are new too. I mean, in property, you'll probably rapidly encounter this idea of, you know, the bundle of sticks or whatever it is. And so, you know, you might think as a lay person listening to this, like, well, either you own something or you don't own it. Ha ha ha. Just you wait. (laughs) I know. You know, and so I think it could be conceptually challenging. And I think you're right. You know, you can feel oftentimes particularly with these older cases, it's like reading a foreign language. Absolutely. And, um, you know, some of these cases have a lot of mythology around them. You know, Panoyer versus Neff is one that everybody kind of groans because people t- even talk about it as like, oh, when you have to read that in the first year, it's impossible to get through. And it's not that these old cases are impossible to get through, but it's going to be more laborious because... It's not going to feel like reading a novel, guys. It's going to feel like maybe reading a novel from the 1800s or the 1700s. It depends on when it when it was written. 
Right. And I think sometimes people have a misconception about what they're going to be reading. So you might think, oh, you know, I'll show up to whatever class I'm taking. I'll show up to contracts. And on day one, I'll read a book that tells me what a contract is. And Mm -hmm. then we'll move on. And that's just not the way law school works. You know, on day one, you'll probably read three or four different cases. And they might be about the meaning of a contract. And they might all disagree with each other. And you might walk out of class more confused about what a contract is than when you set foot in the class. Yeah. And that's normal. And hopefully that confusion will work itself out (laughs) as the semester rolls on. But these early days can be very challenging. And, um, you know, I think for top performers who go to law school, you know, you typically don't go to law school unless you felt pretty confident about your undergrad experience. It can be very humbling to all of a sudden not be able to do your reading as fast as you could, not be able to synthesize it as fast as you could, not be able to understand it. (laughs) You know, I think it's kind of one of those things, right? You're an undergrad. By the time you're finished with undergrad, you've been working in your major. You should be very comfortable with the, you know, landscape of the material that you're dealing with on a regular basis. And then you drop yourself into law school. It's a completely different ballgame. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Exactly. You know, you've studied for four years a certain topic and you, by the time you graduate, you know, if you're doing well, you should be able to have a reasonable conversation about that topic, probably with someone who is a scholar in the field and feel pretty confident that you are not completely, you know, talking out of your uh, wazoo. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But in law school, you know, this is typically not something people have studied before. It's not an educational system that's necessarily immediately all that logical. You know, it can be very unclear what you're supposed to be taking away from these cases. And so I think sometimes people fall back on that skill set they have before, which is, oh, well, I'll just, you know, I'm going to work to memorize everything that's in these cases and then I know I'll be okay, which is not really the goal. I also think that you can really get misguided by what other folks are doing. You know, people love to talk in law school. They love to talk about what they're doing, how fast they're doing their work, how easily they comprehend stuff. And it can also play mind games with you. You really have to keep your eye on your own game. You know, what's your end goal? What's your method? How are you preparing? And make sure you don't get derailed by a lot of the chit chat that happens in law school, because a lot of people can feel very confident about what they're doing. But if you're a 1L, it is too early to be confident. Nobody's taken exams yet. <laughs> Nobody is, uh, you know, there's no been no gauge of who actually knows what's going on and who's actually able to um, to get results. Right. And sometimes you hear people on the internet or maybe your classmates or in a book or whatever it is saying, oh, you don't even need to bother reading the cases. You can just read a supplement. You can start this summer, or just read the supplements. You'll be good to go. And, you know, while I think obviously there is value in a supplement, I don't think that can substitute for reading the cases, particularly not in the beginning of law school, because part of what you're trying to do is sort of absorb by osmosis the way that legal thinking happens. Right. And that's part of what these cases are supposed to be teaching you is how do leg- you know how do lawyers think, how do judges think, how do you construct an argument in a legal fashion that is persuasive. Right. And hopefully your professors are using the Socratic method well and are using the Socratic method to have the class dialogue really builds on that you know, thought process and that struggle that you're doing outside of class to start to learn um, the skills around legal analysis, making arguments, um, see how legal reasoning plays out in the courts or has played out or has changed over time. Um, And hopefully that's getting really distilled down for you in class. And if it's not, then hopefully it becomes clear with study and supplements. (laughs) So, I mean, but but if somebody does... Like the Socratic method, well, you should really be engaged in uh, learning about these cases as part of class, don't you think? I think so. I mean, I think people can just end up being really confused about what they're supposed to be taking away Mm. because, you know, sometimes often, particularly in the beginning of law school, I think people come in and they want just the facts. Just give me the facts. You know, give me, give me, give me, what's the law? Just tell me what the law is. I just need to know what the law is. If I know what the law is, I'm going to be good to go on the exam. Other people come in thinking, oh, well, you know, everything's arguable. There's not really any, like, law. We could just make an argument whatever way we want. And neither one of those is really accurate. You know, they're both partially accurate and partially inaccurate. Because you need to understand the rules to the extent they exist, but you also have to understand the ambiguity and where they apply or don't apply. 
and what sort of arguments about ambiguity you could be making. You know, is it about the facts, the law, policy? These are all the things that hopefully will become second nature to you by the time you graduate, but certainly probably not in your first semester. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think, um, would you agree that typically the more prestigious of the school, the Ivy Leagues tend to be even more conceptual in class, less less clear on what the laws you're supposed to be learning. <laughs> I think. For sure. I mean, and the funny thing is that the exams are not necessarily any different, but I remember my professor in CIFPRO in the beginning kind of saying, well, I don't really find the rules themselves that interesting, so we're not really going to talk that much about those, but you should still review them on your own. <laughs> and then we get the exam, and it's a straight-up issue spotting, you know, need to know and apply these rules that we had literally, in many cases, like, I don't think even bothered to go over in class. Mm-hmm. I remember one of my professors who had gone to Harvard, my contracts professor, <laughs> being in her office hours and having her say that... She didn't really know what civil procedure was until she studied for the bar. And then she <laughs> had a moment of, that's what we were supposed to be learning in that class? <laughs> because that's yeah. not at all what was covered in my civil procedure class. I know. I mean, I think our whole thing was it ended up being about, like, you know, fairness and equity. Mm-hmm. And then you get an exam that's like, is there personal jurisdiction? <laughs> right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. So, um, so everybody's law school experience is going to vary. Uh, but regardless, you've got to be engaged in class to also learn from the professors. I think one final point about why this is also really important is that your professors are drafting and grading your exams. And what they talk about in class is what they think is important. And so being engaged and present in class, and a lot of that comes from having done the reading and prepared adequately for class, means that you're going to have more insights into what's on the exam. Um, I remember taking one professor a few different times. And by the last time I took her class, I was a master at figuring out what she thought was important (laughs) because I'd taken her class enough times. I'm like, oh, this is totally going to be on the test. (laughs) I should make sure I write this down. (laughs) They often, I mean, they have tells, Mm -hmm. right? You know, if if a professor spends a lot of time talking about a certain topic that seems not really that important, or if they keep coming back again and again and again to the same sort of ideas, you know, they're always applying some particular theory about this or that. And, you know, that's something you probably want to pay attention to because that shows that's what they're interested in. Also, if they're things they write about, yes. you know, one, one idea that you probably should consider is looking up your recent articles that your professor has written in the topic they're teaching you, because there's a very high likelihood those ideas are going to show up on their test. Yeah. Other things that could show up on tests can be, um, certain current events. I've also seen that. Or even listen to what your professors talk about what's going on in their lives. I had a contracts um, exam that was all about moving because my (laughs) professor was moving. (laughs) They're people. What are they thinking about? Exactly. So she was writing hypos about what was going on in her life, about all the, you know, contracts that come up about moving and getting set up in a new house, which turns out there can be a lot of them. So. Oh, I'm sure. All right. Well, before th- those were like advanced level techniques. So let's yes. go back to the basics. Sounds so good. So how can people make sure they're preparing for class correctly and also make the most of this 15, 20, 30 hours a week that they spend doing it? Well, first, I think it's important to set aside enough time to do the reading. This is something that we've talked about in a lot of our time management um, podcasts. But you not only have to have the time to do the reading, but you need to make sure that you're getting high impact quality time, you are focused, you can read without distractions, you're not getting interrupted all the time, um, because then you're just going to start wasting time. And you think it sounds slow to read one page every 10 minutes or so, try having your phone go off the entire time or people interrupting you or try and be at Starbucks and there's a lot of noise and distractions. It's going to get really long really fast. Yeah, and I think it's also important to know yourself. For example, I go a little bit crazy if I'm trying to read in a quiet corner of the library. Mm -hmm. For some reason, my brain is just active and I get distracted by everything. But for me, like I can actually go to a coffee shop and read and focus. But you have to know yourself. You know, you have to know what works for you. But regardless of where or how you do your work, you need to do it in focused chunks when you are actually alert. You know, if you're trying to read, if you're a morning person and you're trying to do your reading at midnight, it's probably not going to be very effective. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. So try different things out. You know, some people also have a time limit for how long they can do this sort of work. 
and remain focused. You know, well, I think I think everyone. Has well, that. everyone has a limit. It's just different <laughs> of what those limits are. But you know, you read books about the, the optimum time to sit in one spot and focus. Sometimes it can be forty five minutes for somebody, or it's no more than ninety minutes. You should just try different things. If you find your mind wandering and that you're not uh, in a good place to keep up with what you're doing, then try and figure out what you can do to break it up and then come back and remain focused. Right. And I'll also literally sometimes set a timer. So, you know, if I want to work on like my Spanish grammar, I'll literally set a timer for 30 minutes. And at that point, I have to go and pick up the book and I just have to get started. Yeah. And that could be a good way if you're really procrastinating is you just set a timer and you make yourself open the book. And it's not even like you have to read 10 pages or whatever. You just have to sit there with a book open. And probably you're just going to start reading at some point. And then Mm -hmm. once you start, it's going to be less painful and you're going to feel better about yourself. Um, But I think you have to carve out these blocks of time, whether it's on the weekends or a certain time during the day. I always found it interesting the people who could read in like 20 minute chunks between classes and things like that. That never worked for me. No, me neither. So when you're reading, it's also really important to, I think, do something active to engage in the reading. So a lot of people like to use a pen or a highlighter to mark up the book. Some folks are going to book brief, which we're going to talk about more in a second. But one of the things to think about is to not highlight or underline every single word. Because that yeah, means, like this shouldn't just be mindlessly underlining. No. And if this was a visual podcast for some comic relief, I would actually go to my bookcase where I still have a few of my favorite textbooks because I don't know why I still have a few of them. But I could show you how I thought every single word in some of those early cases were important. And let me just be on it. They weren't. They weren't. <laughs> but you don't know that. I mean, but you that's don't part know of the that. process. Right. But you need to kind of keep in mind that if you find yourself highlighting entire paragraphs, you're not actually like zoning or having some sort of laser focus into what is in that paragraph. Why is that paragraph important? Is it a new idea? Is it the same idea? And so starting to kind of work with the material and identify um, what's in each case is very important. Um, And you want to also keep in mind what the structure of the case is and what are the things your professor's likely going to ask you as you read. Right. So, you know, in the beginning, obviously, you don't really know what's important. You've never done this. Uh, We're going to give you, I'll give you in a second, a list of some things to look out for. But also, that's one of the reasons you go to class and pay attention is if you are massively highlighting sections of the case that your professor never touched on, those are probably not the most important pieces of the case. Yep. Um, So, you know, something you're just going to get better at over time. But in terms of structure, you know, basic things like the names of the parties, which court was this? Are you in a federal court? Is it a state court? Is it a Supreme Court? Is it a trial court? Is it an appellate court? These things have meaning. You know, yeah. They actually matter. Sometimes the judge is important. You know, If you see a case by learned hand, you will rapidly come to realize like learned hand is a, fa- is a very famous judge. You know, right. Cardozo is mm-hmm. a famous judge. Posner is a famous judge. Do these have more or less significance? Who knows? But something to pay attention to. Yeah. But you're going to start seeing some of those rules come up and have the names of these judges attached to them. <laughs> so they're pretty important. <laughs> right. And, you know, same with Supreme Court cases. Like if we're talking constitutional law, like it might matter if it's a Scalia opinion. Like that's mm-hmm. going to be very different than if someone else wrote that opinion. Very true. Um, what else? So, you know, those are kind of the super basics. And then the procedural history, like how did this case end up happening? This can be a little difficult because you're generally reading appellate cases. So you don't have a lot of like the background of the, you know, the really interesting stuff. Um, I say as someone who clerked on a trial court, um, (laughs) but you know, just the basics of like who filed the case, who appealed it, you know, these are things, this is how you develop your legal judgment. Mm -hmm. Um, um, understanding like, well, why would this person have appealed it? You know, what what were the grounds for appeal? Because those things matter. And who's the person who's asking for the court to review? Because um, in criminal cases, I think it can be pretty clear. It's, usually, it's the defendant usually who's asking for that. But in civil cases, when you have two parties, it can get pretty confusing. And sometimes they switch the order of the parties. So it's not, always, you know, it's like in the Well, case. sometimes like... Yeah, like one of them might have appealed something and then the other like counter claim. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like these, the procedural history can get very complicated. And depending on the class, that might be really important or it might not be that important at all. Right. But it's just a good idea to try and figure out what's the story of this case that got it to where, you know, this opinion was made. And some professors are really into that, not just in your civil procedure class. And they're going to ask you about it if you get called on. 
Right. And actually, there's an interesting series of books one of my professors wrote. It's called sort of like, I think one of them is called Constitutional Law Stories and something similar in a different area. But it's really the backstory of some of these famous cases. Hmm. That sounds interesting. Yeah. So probably don't read that, you know, alongside of your actual <laughs> reading. <laughs> right. But if you are interested, a lot of these cases, you know, are interesting in and of themselves. Yeah. The other thing that you want to make note of are the facts, but make sure that you aren't noting every single mention of the facts. You know, one of the things right. that um, you struggled with in the beginning is like what's important about the facts. And as right. what, you... What's, what's legally significant. What's legally what significant. Say. And you got to learn what that is. But the idea of legally significant facts, which is a phrase you should hear over and over again um, in law school, is what are the facts that had any influence in the outcome? You know... Right. If, what does the case turn on? Exactly. If the defendant has brown hair, and that's the fact pattern in, in the case, but it doesn't matter that the defendant has brown hair or black hair or blonde hair, if that doesn't change the case, then maybe that doesn't need to go in your brief or be noted in your book brief because that's not legally significant. Right. Yeah. So that's part of, again, why you go to class is if you've highlighted a bunch of facts that your professor never talks about, probably those were not the legally significant ones and you need to be looking at different ones. Yes. And then there's, of course, the issues. Allison, as the person who loves issues and clerks, why don't you give <laughs> us a, <laughs> a little primer on what the issues are in a case? Right. Well, the issue is basically, you know, what is this case about, legally speaking? And that requires that you understand the law that applies, which is a large piece of the reason you're reading this case, is to extract that law, preferably at different elements. You can't just, you know, one issue could conceivably be, well, was plaintiff negligent? Okay, yeah, that is a legal issue, but we can't really analyze that without saying, well, you know, what was the duty? Did they breach a duty? Was there harm? What were the damages? Um, so you're really looking, you know, in a pretty granular level about the issues here. Right, and usually an appellate case is not answering the question of just is some was someone negligent. They're right. they're arguing over what was the standard of care as part of duty. They're they're arguing over something that's pretty specific. Sometimes right, more because, than one specific thing, but there's usually a very kind of laser focus. Right. I mean, what people have to understand is at a trial court, you're asking the question, "What were the facts? You know, what happened?" And then, of course, you apply the law. But really, it's like, okay, you know, we find that this is what happened. And based on what happened, here is our decision about how this case should come out. And then on appeal, you don't appeal everything. You appeal some very specific legal issue. Right. So it has, to, like you said, it's like, well, the question on appeal might be, what is the, you know, what was the duty of a child in this situation? Mm -hmm. So then you end up reading this entire case about the duty of a child without necessarily having the context of how that fits into the bigger picture of negligence. And that's yeah. the challenge, really, of law school. Yeah, and oftentimes your case book is taking each part. You know, when they teach negligence, they might have a case that's about, you know, the overarching idea of negligence, but it's possible they won't. <laughs> it's possible that the first case is, you know, let's look at duty, which is part of negligence, but then let's talk about duty for a really long time. And let's read like 15 cases on duty. Of like all different types of duty. You know, right. What's the duty of a bystander who starts to give first aid? Right. And you know, so you're, and you're getting like totally obsessed over, you know, well, what if it's a doctor who's the bystander who gives first aid, which actually I think there is a different duty. I um, think so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's very easy to go down this rabbit hole of like being like, well, what if it's a nurse, you know, oh my God, without having any real context for like how you would use this material because when you get a question on an exam it's going to be a scenario with like 18 different people in it and one of them falls out of a tree and someone else who's a medical student goes to their aid and then you know does something stupid and you're sort of left going okay i know i read a case about a doctor right <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but i think but that's how does how does this fit together? And that's one of the challenging things about preparing for class and moving through the semester is one of your jobs as you're pulling together these briefs as you're preparing for class is to try and start to see how these cases fit together. I mean, case books are put together and your syllabus is put together, hopefully, with, you know, a, a story or a plan to explain the law to you. And these cases are going to build on each other. You know, they're going to be all about the different types of standard of care. And so you're going to have a whole list of all the different rules about the different types of standard of care. Uh, you may have minority and majority opinions. You might have, you know, case law that goes against each other, but you're going to have all this, this law that you're going to be able to talk about that in the outlining process, you're going to fit together. But as you take case by case or one day's reading 
you might have three cases on standard of care and your job is to kind of say, okay, here were the legal issues in each of these three cases. What is the difference in what happened in each of these three? Because the professor is going to want to talk about each one because they're, they're not all going to be the same. If you think they're all the same, then you've missed the point. Right. And they may ask you, well, what's the holding of this case? And what that mm-hmm. means really is what did the judge decide, essentially? Right. Um, you might also hear like black letter law. Sometimes that's the holding. Sometimes it's not. The case might, you know, say that say the appellate judge is a nice person and the casebook editor is a nice person. You might get a paragraph or two at the beginning of the law section that basically more or less explains the law of negligence to you. Right. You know, as was in this, you know, case, whoever versus whoever, negligence requires these four things. And that might be why you're reading this case is you're supposed to write down those four things. And that is the law of negligence. Yeah, exactly. So after you do the legal issue, then you want to say the holding, you know, make sure you note where that is, um, that that's what the court decided. You want to note any law that the court applied. That's what black letter law typically is. And then you've got to move on to the legal reasoning. Why did the court decide what it decided? That's probably what you're going to be spending time in class talking about. Well, and why was there even a dispute? You know, what mm-hmm. what are the what are the two different sides of this argument? Right, they, because it could be that they're trying to create new law that didn't exist before, new standards. Right, um, it could be could that be they're like, com- competing and, ideas, and they got to exactly. pick one. <laughs> you know? Yeah, like yeah, they haven't decided, or they've got some old case from like you know seventeen twenty two that says no one can ever be liable for anything, mm-hmm. and they're like, hmm, maybe this is not really what we want to do. You know, in modern world, so you know you've got to you've kind of got a lot of stuff to make sense of in every case. And it can be kind of complicated. It can, but this is why I think briefing in some way helps you try and organize your thoughts and pull out these important elements in the case. So you can track them and refresh your recollection before class. And if you get called on, have some notes to really guide you. And that's where I think a lot of law students start down the wrong path is they forget the point of the brief a brief is not a recitation of the case. It's not a five-page yeah. document. It's not it, a book report. It's not a book report. It is brief. It is supposed to be notes to yourself um, so you can remember what happened in the case and remember these important things. These can be in book briefs, which um, where you just mark up the, the book. You can use different color highlighters. I know, Allison, you used to book brief a lot, and I think we have some picture examples linked to one of the blog posts in the notes where you guys can see... Um, what brief, book briefing really looks like. Yeah, I mean, I did, I think, one written brief when they required us to, and I was like, this does not seem helpful to me. I'm a visual person. I would rather, you know, doodle in the margin, make some, like, brief notes at the end and draw a little picture and highlight some stuff. Like, that was... But I have pretty good factual recall. So if I saw a little picture, I would remember, oh, yeah, this was the case where the medical student, you know, fell out of the tree or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it all came back to me. Some people do, some people don't. So I think you have to do whatever works for you. I mean, I think sometimes students get so obsessed with briefing and it takes so much time because they're super concerned about being called on and maybe they say something that's not perfect. Um, you know, I think obviously you want to be prepared and it, it's nice if it seems like you're prepared if you get called on. But ultimately that's not really going to impact anything that much you know you want to make you want to make a good faith effort doing the reading taking some notes but it's not a situation where you have to memorize the entire case beforehand because that's not really what your professor is looking for yeah and i did a number of typed briefs but if i had to do it over again um with what we have really learned about handwriting and the importance um, or the link that handwriting has to retention of information I would probably handwrite a lot of my briefs, either book briefs or just in a note paper, because one, I think I'd remember things more, and two, it prevents you from creating the four-page book report. Right, exactly. You can't transcribe the entire case if you're actually writing it out by hand what the key points are. And right. so I just think this is something with briefing to pay attention to, is how much time is it taking you? Is it helping you in class? And is it really helping you understand and distill and summarize the information? Are you doing it because you're so anxious about knowing, not knowing something that you just feel like you have to get everything down on paper, which is pointless. It's already in your book. Right. So the stuff that we just talked about that you need to note in a case, the names of the parties, the court, the opinion came from, the judge, the procedural history, the facts, the issues, the holding, the black letter law and the legal reasoning are all things that you want to note in your brief. 
You can also add a few things. Maybe your professor, like I had a professor who really loved to always raise the government's argument and the defendant's argument. So I had to have briefs that always had the government's argument and the defendant's argument because that's what he asked every time he cold called on somebody. But I also think um, a few other notes that can be very helpful for students to include is a note to yourself about why this case is in the case book or the reading assignment. You know, it's what we just talked about. All these cases are kind of put together to tell a story. So are they setting a standard of care about children where the next one's about the bartender at the bar where the next one's about the bystander? You know, why why is this part of the overall story? If you can figure that out, I think that's also going to create meaning for you when you end up talking about these cases. And also make notes of any questions that you have. I think this is something where um, that students often um, tend to miss out because when you're reading the case, that's when you're going to come up with questions of why right. something doesn't make sense. And you should take them to class with you and ask them. You're paying a lot of money to go to class, <laughs> like ask questions. Right. And another thing I've seen, which I think makes a lot of sense, is even before you read a case, it can be helpful if you've covered part of a topic to think about what questions do you still have about this topic and is this case going to answer them? Mm-hmm. And you know, you want to, the whole point here is you need to be an active reader, someone who's engaging with the material and asking questions and thinking about it, not just kind of getting from page one to page 20 and putting your book away and being like, okay, done with that. Never have to think about it again. Right. You know, you're going to be more effective if you're curious about these things and thinking, well, where, what's missing here? What do I not know yet? And Mm -hmm. does this case fill in any piece of that for me? Yeah, I think it's a really good point. Um, Another thing to think about is a lot of folks find value in kind of doing a brief if you're going to do a handwritten or a typed brief after you finish reading the case, or even if you go back to do the book brief and make more notes in the case after you're finished reading, it's a great review of it. And it allows you to take that step back and say, did I understand what was going on in the case? Again, if you brief too much while you're reading, it's likely you're going to track too much information because you haven't gotten to the end yet. You don't know what's important (laughs) until you get to the end. Yeah, you should not be making notes as you go about what the important legally significant facts are before you've read the law or the legal reasoning, because you have no idea. Right, exactly. Um, You know, this is something else that we have seen students end up doing. um, And Allison, I think we've had tutoring students and other students that we've talked to do this, is they end up reading cases a number of times. Oh, yeah. Love to do this. (laughs) And why do you think (laughs) students feel like this is a good use of their time? Well... I mean, I think there is a temptation to feel like I need to know everything before I get before I go into class. You know, people don't like uncertainty. Well, if I could just read it again, I'm sure it would make more sense. It's not going to make more sense. Right. Um, you know, I think, you know, this is the, we go back to the old good confusion and bad confusion idea. If you re- get to the end of a case and you literally have no idea what the case was about or what was decided or anything, well, that's a problem. But if you get to the end of the case and you think, well... I'm a little confused about how this fits into the big structure. I'm confused about how two of these cases relate to each other. You don't need to reread them at that point. You need to go to class and listen to the discussion and ask those questions. Um, But also, it's just easy, you know? I mean, it makes you feel like you're being really diligent to read a case for the third time. But I guarantee you there are other things you could be spending time on that are going to be a lot more effective. Yeah, I think that that's true. And one of those other activities that can be more effective are supplements if used well. <laughs> so sometimes supplements can help you, but sometimes they can also be a time-wasting activity. Yeah, absolutely. I think used wisely, supplements can be invaluable and really help you get through law school. But if you use them unwisely, they can waste a ton of time. They can give you a false sense of security and they can end up not helping you at all. I think one of the main things that students can find themselves doing is spending a lot of time reading about things that aren't going to be covered in their class. It can be hard at the beginning to really understand that these topic areas are gigantic. I mean, people study contracts or real property or these scholarly areas for their entire careers. And if you're taking one semester on property, you're not going to talk about every single thing in property. And if you get too obsessed with your supplement, you could end up spending a lot of time studying stuff that's not going to be on your exam and showing your professor that you read all of that stuff does not make them happy. They want you to learn what they think is important, which is what's on the exam. Yeah, absolutely. Or like, you know, you may be taking a crim law class where your professor, for whatever reason, decides you're not going to talk about the model penal code. Well, pretty much every supplement you open up is going to talk about the model penal code. So if you read a supplement and you start talking on your exam about, well, the model penal code says this, that's not going to end well. Yeah, exactly. 
So make sure that if you're spending time doing supplement reading, that you're getting something out of it and that you are, um, it is helping your understanding in class or save it till after class and you can use it as part of your deep work. Right. I think, you know, there are different ways to use them. People, some people like to have an overview before they start reading the cases so they kind of know where the section is going. That's completely valid as long as you don't, you know, rely on it too heavily. But you might want to sit down and just skim through a basic supplement about whatever topic area is coming up next. And then you have some context. You can kind of understand how the things fit together. Or probably more likely is when you've gone to done the reading, gone to class, and it's time to sit down and make your study aids, then you can pull out the supplement and understand, oh, okay, this is the basic outline of the law here. And then from there, you fit in all the different pieces that your professor is focused on. Yeah, definitely. And I think lastly, to always keep in mind through your law school experience, but especially in the beginning, remember that it's okay to struggle. And um, giving up on the struggle and just resorting to reading canned briefs or Googling cases before you read them isn't really going to get you where you need to be, (laughs) unfortunately. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think if you're really struggling with a certain case or in general, looking at a brief that somebody else made on Quimby or wherever you find it, you know, in a book, that can be helpful, but you just have to be careful not to rely too heavily on that. I mean, I know someone who went to school with me at Columbia who ended up failing the bar exam multiple times. And part of the reason ended up being basically because they hadn't done the reading as a 1L. Mm hmm. Yeah, which is, <laughs> which is something I think one else forget is that the bar exam is all about these classes. <laughs> like these classes are going to find you again. So blowing them off is not a good idea because they're going to rear their ugly heads bar exam time. Right. And also, you know, a lot of these briefs, everybody has a different viewpoint. Everyone's professor has a different viewpoint. You can end up wasting a lot of time because a lot of these cases have multiple threads of law going on at once. And your casebook author or your professor might have picked this case for a completely different reason than someone else. You know, yeah. you could use, you might end up reading the same case in three different classes. You know, it might have a civ pro element. Maybe there's a contract element and maybe you read it, you know, in an intellectual property class because it's about patents. Like you could pick and choose a lot of different stuff to think is important. Mm-hmm. And That's part of what you're learning to do when you do the reading. Oh, that is a good point. I'd forgotten that sometimes you will see a case in a different class that's there for a completely different reason. It's kind of fascinating. Yeah. I mean, it's not like judges are writing these cases for law students. Yeah. They're writing them for real life. Right. Usually, you know, typically any sort of case that ends up going to trial or being appealed has multiple issues going on at once. Yep. And that really full circle is why it's important to learn how to read cases. Because when you start practicing law, one of your jobs um, is likely going to be doing research and writing, which is what most lawyers spend their time doing. And you have to read cases and write about them and understand them and be able to pull out the legal reasoning and what the court said in the black letter law. um, So you can write motions um, or talk to your supervisor about what the state of the law is. And you're laying the foundation for this work right at the beginning of your first semester. Yeah, and it's one of those things that in the beginning, even though it doesn't seem like it, you actually do have time built in to learn how to read a case because your reading load is actually, sorry to tell you, not <laughs> not as heavy as it's going to be later. That is true. You are right. So if you skip this process in your first semester, then when second semester rolls around and your professors assume you know how to read cases and do briefs and go to class and get the main points, and suddenly instead of having 20 pages of reading a class, you might have 40 pages. Yeah. So you need to be better at this by the time, you know, your workload increases. Yeah. And you and will. You, and you will. And you only will. if you if you struggle through it now, but you may as well start struggling. Yeah. And with that, I think we're out of time. But before we finish up, uh, we wanted to take a second to let you know that you can check out our Start Law School Right course on our website at um, HTTP colon slash back slash back law school toolbox dot com slash start dash law dash school dash right. And this on demand course includes feedback from one of our amazing law school toolbox tutors. And you even get feedback on briefing. Woohoo! Woohoo! <laughs> but it's going to help you understand how to excel academically from day one and hopefully answer, hopefully answer a few of the common questions you might have about things like class prep. But check it out and feel free to contact us if you have any questions. You can start uh, prepping for your 1L year at any point. If right, you- because we actually literally have you read a case and brief that case and talk to the, you know, talk, get feedback on are you getting the right things or are you not. 
And you go through the entire thing and end up taking an exam that actually relates to that case. Yeah. It's pretty fun. It's pretty exciting. If you you enjoyed this episode of the Law School Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review and rating on iTunes. We'd really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. Our episodes typically are released on Mondays. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or Allison at lee at lawschooltoolbox.com or allison at lawschooltoolbox.com, or you can always contact us via our contact form at lawschooltoolbox.com. Thanks for listening. Good luck with your class prep, and we'll talk soon. Thank you.